Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. It's a pleasure to introduce Martin Bircher. Martin Bircher is an assistant professor in the School of, of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Cornell University. He got his master and bachelor degree from ETH in Zurich in 1996, and then his PhD from the University of Colorado in Boulder in, in 2000. Uh, Martin's been working on uh, a number of areas related to multiprocessing, uh, data compression, and uh, today he's going to talk about uh, techniques for creating fast data compressors. All right. Thank you, Ben. Thank you for being here. So this talk is really about taking ideas from one domain and applying them to a completely different domain that they were never originally meant for, and actually making uh, a significant impact in this new area. So there are four uh, components to this talk. First, I'll briefly talk about hardware architecture value prediction, because that's the domain where I'm going to take my ideas from. Then I'll apply them first to a program trace compression, where um, I essentially take the value predictor algorithms, but I use them in a compression environment rather than a prediction environment. Then I'll talk about uh, TCGen, which is essentially an application-specific code optimizer and compiler that um, generates VPC compression algorithms based on a simple input language that describes your trace format. And um, finally, I'll talk about FPC, a floating point compression algorithm that, again, uses value prediction ideas and also um, heavily uh, depends on code optimization for um, fast performance. So I'm going to focus on two types of data, uh, program uh, execution traces, as well as the results of scientific programs. <coughs> Now, as you probably all know, program execution traces are just dynamic logs of what happened while you executed a program. For example, which PCs were touched or whatever else um, you want. And these are frequently used uh, to study program and processor behavior. And if you've ever used traces, you're painfully aware of their biggest downside, and that is they tend to be huge. Okay? Just as an example, if you record on average one byte of information per executed instruction on a high-end microprocessor, you're looking at a gigabyte of information per second of CPU time. Of course, you want to trace more than one second, and you probably have to trace a whole benchmark suite, not just a single application. And before you know it, you're in the hundreds of gigabytes. Um, scientific programs also deal with a lot of data. Um, they're used to model all kinds of physical phenomena, weather forecasting, car crashes, airplane wing design, you name it, somebody's doing it. <clears throat> and they uh, tend to transfer a lot of data between compute nodes and mass storage devices on the order of hundreds of megabytes per second. And they also tend to generate a lot of new data that needs to be stored away on the order of a terabyte each day. So, of course, um, when you're dealing with such uh, large amounts of data, um, there's a, a cost associated to it, uh, with it. First of all, it, it may cost you money to store it away or even to transfer it if you uh, pay by the byte. And it takes a long time to move the data from one place to another. And, of course, it's very well known that data compression can alleviate all these problems. <coughs> In particular, if you have a very good compression ratio, then you can shrink the amount of data a lot and therefore save uh, uh, storage as well as uh, transfer time. <coughs> but you probably don't just want a high compression ratio. You also want a very fast compression algorithm to minimize the overhead of, of doing the compression and decompression. In fact, if your overhead is less than the time saved because you now have to deal with less data, then um, you can, in fact, increase the throughput even though you added an extra stage um, to your uh, uh, system. <clears throat> Moreover, you probably want a single pass algorithm so that you can compress the data as it is being generated and decompress it as you 
uh, consume it. Um, and that has the benefit that the original large uncompressed data set never actually has to exist as a whole anywhere in the system. It's always uh, compressed. <clears throat> And finally, at least in the two domains that I'm looking at, you probably want lossless compression. For program traces, you're exactly interested in the outliers, et cetera, right? Not the normal behavior. That you already know. So if you did lossy compression, you would exactly lose those outliers. Um, yes? But you could do the lossy compression to eliminate all the problems. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, yes, you could, I suppose. That's a different kind of lossy compression, though. Right. right. Um, and in, uh, in the scientific computing domain, you probably don't want lossless compression because, for example, you don't want to loss, lossily compress a, a checkpoint or something like that because then who knows what will happen when you have to bring it back in. <clears throat> so that brings me to value predictors. Uh, of course, uh, you know that most CPUs don't operate anywhere near uh, their theoretical peak performance. And three of the main culprits are cache misses. If you have to go to main memory, that takes so long that the CPU has to stall because it runs out of things to do. Um, low instruction level parallelism. Um, the CPU may be able to execute four instructions per cycle, but most of the time you don't have four independent instructions to run. And of course, branch mispredictions. <clears throat> Now, value predictors were designed to help or alleviate the first two problems and uh, speed up CPUs in the process. So the idea is very similar to branch prediction, except uh, you apply it to register writing instructions. So you try to predict what value they will generate. Um, and you do that by observing what values that particular instruction generated in the past when it was executed. And if you see a pattern, you can extrapolate it and therefore relatively um, accurately predict what the instruction will do in the future. If you do that, you can increase your instruction level parallelism because you can now run producer consumers together because the consumers can use the predicted value. You don't have to wait for the producer to finish first. And for the same reason, you can hide some or all of the memory latency because you can now run your load instructions along with the dependent instructions. And because uh, value predictors are supposed to make billions of predictions per second in hardware, they have to use very fast and simple algorithms, which uh, will be beneficial um, for compression purposes, as we'll see. <clears throat> so um, to show you how simple these algorithms really are, um, here's the first type of predictor that's frequently used is the last n value predictor. So it's just a table where you have n slots for each instruction, modulo the table size, where you store the last n results that it generated. So that when you fetch that instruction again, you can read out the n results, and those are your prediction. Or if you just want, want one prediction, you can select one of them. In fact, most of the time, this is, uh, predictor only has one entry per line anyhow, so that uh, solves the selection problem. <clears throat> um, this predictor works reasonably well, actually. But you can do better. Uh, this is the stride predictor. It works almost exactly the same way, except you store the differences between consecutive results that are being generated rather than the absolute values. And in the end, when you make these n difference predictions, you just add them to the previous result that that instruction generated to produce your um, absolute predictions. <clears throat> now. Uh, this works a little bit better than the predictor on the previous slide because it can predict the same things, differences of zeros. That's the last value predictor. So this is straight in the values. Well, that's the assumption of the model, yes. If there is, you will find it. You will do OK. If there isn't, it'll just be random numbers. Um, but this predictor can predict values that were never before generated, such as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. You can predict the 6, whereas the predictor on the previous slide can only predict values that have already been produced in the past. So this predictor is a little more powerful. <clears throat> you can do much better with a two-level scheme, though. And here's the finite context method predictor of order x. And it has two tables that 
work almost exactly like the last value predictor, except the result coming out of the first table um, is run through a hash function to calculate the index into the second table, which will then give you the predictions. And really what this is is nothing but uh, a, a hash table. And what you're doing is um, every time you have a certain context of x previous results that were generated, you store away the value that followed that sequence. So the next time any other instruction goes through that same sequence of x previously generated results, you can do a table lookup and see, ah, this is what other instructions generated next and predicted correspondingly. And in fact, if the tables are large enough and, and your hash function is good, you can memorize very long arbitrary sequences of values and predict them correctly when they repeat. Uh, the differential finite context method predictor, again, takes us a step further by uh, predicting and updating with um, differences rather than absolute values, kind of like the stride predictor did relative to the last value predictor. So these predicted strides then have to be added to the previously generated result to give you the final prediction. But otherwise, this predictor works exactly the same way as the one on the previous slide. <coughs> so these are the four major um, value predictors that have been proposed. Most of the predictors are variations of these and then there's maybe one or two um, other ones. But I'll focus on these four. Are, are um, these actually used in, in uh, real hardware? Oh, gonna... No. <laughs> it's exactly the problem. Okay? So there's several issues. First of all, with realistic table sizes that you can implement in hardware and run at, at core clock frequencies, you can only hope to get about 50% of the instructions predicted right. Okay? As a result, the speed up is relatively small, typically less than 10% for your average benchmark speed. Moreover, adding value predictors, of course, increases your power consumption and temperature, two things that industry is really trying to move away from. And uh, it adds complexity. It's not trivial uh, to add such a component. And there's currently no CAT tool support for this. Um, for example, increasing your cache size is much simpler because that's supported by the existing cache, cat tools. There are no cat tools for value predictors, so those would have to be created from scratch, which is a big initial hurdle. And <clears throat> that uh, basically, as a result, for all of these reasons and possibly others, um, industry has not really adopted uh, value prediction. However, so you, you're associating cat tools with functionality. That's, uh, Partially. So what, what, what is it, what's the world of CAD tools like for branch prediction? They have sort of standard branch prediction mechanisms that they drop in the same way? Um, I believe so. I mean, they have libraries of different predictors as far as I know. Yeah, I'll, I'll be very surprised if well, you associate functionality with the CAD tools. So, so you, you'd associate in like a, some kind of, uh, so for example, CAM structures versus RAM structures versus, um, I'm not sure if you want to go, uh, anyway, it's besides the point. <laughs> well, I'm sure they use different CAT tools for cache designs, for example, than for ALU designs. I mean, these are like totally disjoint. <clears throat> so in spite of, uh, uh, microprocessor manufacturers not having adopted uh, these ideas, I think the techniques that were developed are still extremely useful and uh, that's uh, what the rest of the talk will be about. And the first example is uh, program trace compression. So again, a trace is just a log of say all the touch PCs or all the addresses that were loaded from or stored to or the results of uh, all your multiplication instructions or whatever else you're interested in. There's a lot of related work, and in fact, there's even a lot of freely downloadable uh, trace compressors. Unfortunately, almost all of them are tied to a specific trace format, such as dinero or, or something else. And if your information that you want to trace does not fit in that format, you're out of luck. You either have to use a general purpose compressor, which will probably not compress all that well, um, or you have to re-implement 
whatever trace compression algorithm people have come up with um, for your trace format, which of course is error prone and time intensive and you're probably not going to do it. <coughs> um, also, most of the related work focuses on PC and address traces for historic reasons. PC traces for branch predictor design, address traces for memory hierarchy designs. <coughs> While those two areas are still very important, I think we've kind of entered a new era of, of looking at the actual values that we operate on. Uh, these things are important for significance compression. You may not want to run your full 64-bit ALU if the two operands are effectively byte values. Or um, say you want to suppress um, coherence messages if you write uh, a value to a memory location that's already in that location, and, and things like that. Okay? <clears throat> so um, we wanted to design a, a trace compressor that, that works really well on PC address and, and value traces. And really the insight I, I was having one day when I was running a trace study and, and, and I was annoyed at the size of the traces and uh, because I was actually driving a simulated value predictor with it, I realized that the value predictor effectively what it was doing was predicting the entries in the trace. Okay? So I I thought, hmm, that's interesting. Maybe I should try a value predictor based trace compressor. And in fact, that works really well because the value predictors were designed to predict the types of information you typically find in a CPU register, which happens to also be the type of information you typically store in a program trace, right? Such as PCs, addresses, instruction results, etc. But the, the value prediction model, it's probabilistic. There's a certain probability wired into that model, right? Correct. So when a person is you know, storing traces, he, he really probably wants to have a log of what the system is actually doing. Yes. Now, in this, if, if I were to you know, predict traces using this mechanism, there is probably a small probability which says that the, the, the trace entries obtained by this prediction mechanism, there is a small chance that it may not be really recording what the system is actually because it's it's predicting entries. Yes. So of course, if, if the model that you know the model that the you know the differential the the striding model that is underlying the value predictor, if it's not really exactly modeling what the system is actually doing, right? Then the trace entries may not be exactly. Yes. Um, however, note that I'm I'm only attempting to predict them. I allow for the possibility that the prediction is wrong. In which case, I record that fact okay. and I fix it up. Okay. So this is lossless compression. I can regenerate okay. the original trace exactly, okay. bit for bit. Okay. But you're absolutely right. You know, 90% of the time, maybe my prediction is correct. But the other 10, I have to do something. Okay. And here is actually what I do. Okay. So I, I take a set of predictors. I try to predict my next trace entry. If at least one of the predictors gets it right, then I only record a short few bit ID specifying which predictor and nothing else. If none of the predictors get it right, I, I emit a, a reserved ID and I also emit the unpredictable value. Okay? Then I update all the predictors and I repeat this procedure for the next uh, trace entries until I've compressed the entire trace. Now decompression proceeds analogously. You read one of these identifiers if it's the identifier for a predictor, you know that at this point, that corresponding predictor has the value exactly right, so you can just use that predictor's prediction. And if the code is, is the reserved extra code, you know that all the predictors are wrong, but you also know the next thing in the input is the correct value, so you can get it from there. And then again, you update all the predictors to make sure that their state is exactly the same as it was at this point in the trace during compression, and you iterate until you have uh, decompressed the entire trace. Now, the actual algorithm that we're using is a little uh, more sophisticated, um, as indicated on this slide here. So up on top in blue, I have an uncompressed original trace uh, where each trace record has two fields, a 4-byte PC field and a 8-byte data field. So what I do is I have a set of predictors for the PC field and a different set of predictors for the data field. 
So first I try to predict this PC. I'm assuming all four predictors here uh, get it wrong and therefore I write the reserved code of zero to this first output stream and I also record the value that none of the predictors could guess in the second stream. Then I move on. I try to uh, predict the data field with, in this example, 10 predictors. And I'm assuming the last predictor gets it right. So I write this guy's um, identification code to the third stream and nothing to the fourth stream. Okay? So there's a, a three major differences from what I described in the previous slide. First of all, I have multiple sets of predictors depending on how many fields I have in the input trace. Um, second of all, I separate the predictor codes from the unpredictable values on purpose because what I do with these streams is I compress them further with bzip or gzip or whatever you want. And by uh, separating these, it, the streams are actually much more predictable than, than when I uh, mix these up in almost random ways. <coughs> And then the output of uh, bzip in this case is my compressed trace. You can concatenate the four if you want into a single file. <coughs> but uh, and uh, decompression is just you know reversing the direction of the arrows basically. Okay. So um, this algorithm, like most other algorithms, has a major problem, and that is it only works for traces with. 4 by PCs and 8 by data fields. What if you want to trace a 32-bit architecture with only 4 by data fields? Or what if you want to record more than one piece of data for each instruction that's executed? You need two data fields. Well, you're out of luck. Okay? And that's why I wrote this tool called TCGen, which um, automatically generates a VPC compressor for you based on a very simple trace format description. And as it does that, it also performs application-specific optimizations, which I'll talk a little bit in a second. Uh, and it emits the trace compressors in C source code, which you can then compile on whichever architecture you want to um, use it on. I'm going to show you um, what you need to specify uh, with TCGen on the example I used in the previous slide, so 4 byte PCs and 8 byte data fields. But it'll be obvious how you would extend it to other formats. <coughs> So the code in green here is all you have to write. Okay? There's a zero byte header because I'm assuming my data starts right away. If, if your trace files start with some magic number or something, that would be the header. And then there's uh, records with two fields. The first is a 32-bit wide field, and the second one is 64 bits wide. If you wanted a third field, you just add a third field. If your field sizes are different, you just change the size. Okay? So this is it, not very hard. Um, of course, uh, TCGen will generate a workable um, compressor decompressor for this format, but it will probably not uh, perform as well as you might hope. So expert users can actually specify more things, such as uh, which predictors to use for each field, how many predictions they should make, and uh, what their first and second level um, table sizes should be. Now you can leave any part of this out if you don't want to specify it. It'll just plug in uh, defaults for you. Or you can specify it. In case you're wondering how you figure out what's a good configuration, well, at the end of every compression, um, it prints statistics to the screen that tell you how often uh, each predictor component was used. So you can take out the ones that were useless and try a few other ones. So you can do a few rounds of trial and error, and you, you end up with a pretty good configuration for your type of trace <coughs> relatively quickly. If you don't like bzip, you can specify any other uh, command lines, for example, gzip, or uh, cat if you want nothing, or uh, a tool that you wrote yourself. As long as it uh, supports standard in and standard out, um, you can use it directly in this way. Now, um, like I mentioned, TCGen performs several optimizations on the code. The first is common subtable elimination, which is kind of like common sub-expression elimination, except it operates on, on data structures rather than um, uh, instructions. So you may have noticed that the last value stride and the DFCM predictors, they all have a last value table and other things. 
So if you use any combination of these, TCGen will only allocate one last value table and share it among the predictors. Likewise, all the FCMs and DFCMs um, can share, can partially share their first level tables. In fact, TCGen will only allocate the, the highest order uh, first level table and all the lower order predictors can then use whatever fraction of the table that they need. <coughs> the next important optimization is uh, hash function strength reduction and common sub-expression elimination. So first of all, the hash functions are computed incrementally based on the result from the previous iteration um, rather than uh, recalculated from scratch, which is much faster. And second of all, it's calculated in an interesting way such that the intermediate results are exactly the correct hashes for all the lower order uh, predictors. So those are essentially obtained for free. <coughs> there are several other um, application specific optimizations, um, including unused parameter elimination, et cetera. Um, and then finally, because you emit C code, of course you get all the optimizations that your standard um, C compiler provides. So on this slide, I'm showing you um, compression ratio results for three types of traces from spec CPU 2000 programs. First, the, the, I'm sorry. The, the DCGen output is the, the, v, the VPC, right? Yes, uh, so I, I'll get to that. But VPC4 here is the compiled output of TCGen. So when you say application-specific optimizations, what is the application part over there? Because Trace compressors. These optimizations don't really apply to general programs. Merging the tables and you know right, so computing this hash specific, function. You're talking of VPC applications. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Give me a dumb question. What kind of trace? What kind of trace? What do you mean by trace? Sorry, I came in a little late. Um, basically, a program execution trace where you record, for example. Um, PCs of all the executed instructions or the memory addresses that were touched. So like an instrumentation trace? Exactly. Uh, exactly. And it would kind of be in the format that you said. So a line by line, a bunch of fields. Right. Precisely. Great. Uh, okay. Later, I, I assume you're going to go into other, uh, because I specifically am interested in um, a compressor tuned for, for example, executable content itself, not the trace, but PE content itself. Oh, okay. That? That's a, no, that's a different animal. We we can talk about that offline. I mean, I have other um, compressor awesome. algorithms. <clears throat> so um, here there are three types of traces: uh, PCs and the effective addresses of all the executed store instructions in the Spec CPU 2000 programs. This is just a plain vanilla address trace, like people have been looking at forever. Then another address trace for all the loads and stores that miss in a simulated L1 data cache. Um, this address trace is much harder to compress because the L1 filters out a lot of the nice patterns in the address trace. And then you only see what's left, namely what misses in the cache. And finally, um, traces of a PC and loaded values of all the load instructions. These are also hard to compress because loads load all kinds of different things, floating point values, integer values, character strings, bit masks, you name it. Right? <clears throat> I'm uh, showing compression ratio relative to VPC4 for uh, BZIP2, which is just a general purpose, relatively well compressing um, algorithm that has no idea that we're using traces here. The other five are special purpose trace compressors, so they can't really be used to compress anything else, or it, it just doesn't make sense. And they all use BZIP2 as a second stage compressor, not just uh, VPC4. So there's Sequitur here, which um, essentially generates a context-free grammar out of the, the program input and uh, compresses it that way. This works really well for PC-only traces, but not so well for um, address traces, as you can see. Um, MASH is an older uh, address trace compressor that essentially um, specifies uh, the, uh, the differences of the current entry to some base entry and expresses that in, in a byte if it can. If it can't, it specifies the full value, and that becomes the new base. Uh, PDATs, and especially PDATs2, 
It goes a little bit further. They operate on strides, that is, differences between consecutive values, and uh, specify them in however many bytes they need. So there's a header byte that specifies how many bytes will follow. And the header byte also has room for the most common values. <coughs> so it compresses that way. SBC, stream-based compressor, that is a new address compressor developed at the same time as VPC. And it works by identifying um, streams, that is, a sequence of, of increasing values. And whenever that same sequence repeats, it's just replaced by an index saying, hey, this is the same sequence again. And then VPC4, as I said, the output of TC Gen. <clears throat> And uh, as you can see, most of these algorithms actually don't compress all that much in the first stage. It's really the post compressor that does most of the work. <clears throat> but at least in case of VPC4, which, by the way, compresses worse than Sequitur and um, SPC in the first stage, but better overall. Um, the reason is because VPC4 was designed with the second stage in mind. Remember, I create these two streams instead of one, exactly because that helps the second stage. And I output the predictor codes in, in bytes, even though I don't need eight bits. There aren't that many predictors. But BZIP works on byte granularity, so it's much better to do that. Um, the other algorithms try to compress as much as they can in the first stage. And as a result, unfortunately, obfuscate a lot of the nice patterns and make it harder for BZIP to do a good job. Okay? So it's better to optimize for the full system rather than optimize each individual component um, separately. <clears throat> so overall, as you can see, um, VPC4 compresses almost uh, twice as well as the other algorithms. On average, certainly not in every single trace. Um, on the address traces, SBC gets pretty close, but again, the other algorithms are roughly a factor of two worse. <clears throat> now, looking at the decompression time, now lower is better. We can see that VPC4 is also one of the fastest, except on, on these two types where um, Sequitur is a couple percent faster, so not, not a big difference. <clears throat> And um, uh, compression time, VPC4 is actually a factor of two and a half faster than, than all the others. And it's, except for a single trace, it's the fastest on every trace that we tried. And again, you can see that relatively little time compared to these others, except for sequitur, is actually spent in BZIP2, even though we send more information to BZIP2 than necessary by making it by granularity, for example. But we help BZIP2 in turn so much to recognize patterns that it not only compresses better, but it also operates much faster. Okay. <clears throat> How do you explain the, the significant uh, additional time that these other things are doing? I mean, you know, it seems like, yeah, I mean, were they just not tuned or something? or? It, I don't know the no, like I said, I, I think the, the major problem why BZIP2 takes so long here is because really what the other algorithms tried to do in the first stage is compress as well as possible. And that totally obfuscates the output and makes it really hard for BZIP2 to be effective. So BZIP2 has to do a lot of work to kind of disentangle what's going on. And uh, obviously it, its running time depends on on, on, on the input, and, and it's apparently not a good format for it. <clears throat> so uh, to summarize these uh, middle two parts, I showed you the uh, VPC algorithm that's based on, on value predictor uh, uh, ideas. Uh, they have the highest harmonic mean compression ratio and fastest compression speed. Um, also on the majority of the traces, not on every trace. And decompression is also the fastest except for sequitur, like I said, which is a few percent faster. In absolute terms, I've seen uh, compression ratios between 5.8, which is not so bad if you think about it, six times smaller trace, up to 77,000, which is pretty impressive. So there's this one address trace where on average we compress 77 kilobytes into a single byte. <laughs> Um, 
In terms of throughput, on an old alpha system, we get uh, 5 to 40 megabytes per second decompression speed and 2 to 23 megabytes per second compression speed. On a modern Pentium 4 system, these numbers are about double. So they're faster than uh, a cheap hard disk. So that means it's, it's actually quicker to read a compressed trace from the disk and decompress it in the CPU than reading the uncompressed uh, trace. And finally, I've talked about TCGen, which is this uh, compiler, if you will, that compiles your simple trace description into um, C source code that you can then compile and run on your system. TCGen is uh, freely available at this URL. You can also get to it from my homepage by clicking on TCGen. And um, it's actually pretty widely used. Uh, researchers at MIT, CMU, Princeton, Intel, Colorado, um, San Diego, and a few other places use it as far as I know. And uh, they seem to be pretty happy with it. <coughs> so the uh, final part of this talk is uh, floating point data compression. Now, um, as I mentioned earlier, scientific programs produce and transfer a lot of 64-bit uh, double precision floating point data. And there's quite a bit of related work, but most of it is on lossy compression, which I'm not uh, focusing on today. And uh, what uh, little work uh, focuses on lossless compression is typically concerned with 32-bit single precision uh, data, as is frequently used in games, etc. cetera. Um, but I'm focusing on 64-bit data. And uh, there are really only two um, types of work that I'm familiar with there. And one focuses on, on smoothness in data. So they assume that consecutive floating point values differ by only a small uh, amount. And the other one um, exploits geometry. So they know that this, the sequence of data that you're looking at is actually a linearized form of a 2D or a 3D um, object. And they use that information to um, compress it better. <coughs> Now, our approach is, is more general purpose. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me just understand a little bit more about the domain. So, so there's a bunch of work on lossy compression of floating yes. point numbers? Yes. Oh, that's so trivial, right? right? Because of the, right. the way it's, it's, it's expressed with the mantissa, you can just chop off bits at why the did, end. Why do scientists find that compelling to lose all that data? Oh, they don't. That's exactly my point. They want loss less. So what do they use, generally, if, they, if, if most of the work is loss, loss C? And they really want Okay, the, the, the hard truth is high performance computing environments do not use data compression because there is nothing suitable so far. Okay. I hope to change that. Okay, so, <laughs> so we're talking all this NASA data. Yes. Gig terabytes, literally. Correct. All this stuff coming down from the space shuttle or whatever, from the right. Mars Explorer. Right. They don't use data compression on those streams. No, they have huge facilities with tapes where it gets recorded and never looked at, literally. Okay, there's in fact, just this is as an aside, okay, NASA apparently downloads so much data every day that there is no way they can possibly analyze it all. So what they do is they store it away, and researchers all across the globe, they look at all kinds of things. When they find something interesting, I don't know, some star exploded, then they'll know what time that happened. They go back to their archives and they read all the other data around that time to see whether there was something interesting too. But two-thirds of the data is never ever looked at by a human or a program. Okay? But you never know when you're going to need it, so you store it away. Okay. So, um, so yeah, we want a, a compressor that doesn't need... Um, this I don't know what they do there because that's a that's really a different domain. Lossless, Lossless as well. You never know what you're going to need. Yeah. See, the other thing is I, I was also I was surprised by that. I talked to people from Lawrence Livermore National Lab, and they basically said, "Look, you can't really make it lossy for several reasons. First of all, um, yeah, you don't know what other people might." want to do with the data. Second of all, a lot of times they compute certain data, and I don't understand all of this, but they then compute derived information from that data, and they need certain accuracy guarantees. Um, thirdly, like I said, I mean, program checkpoints, et cetera, they have to be lossless. 
because every bit counts, right? And um, there's other types of data where they actually reason about the accuracy of the program. They know they wrote the algorithm in a certain way. They know the properties about IEEE 754 floating point operations, etc. So they can bound the maximum error. So, and that's obviously important for them. Otherwise, they wouldn't go through um, this exercise. So clearly, they didn't, don't want you to all of a sudden come along and you know, take away from, from what they've done. <coughs> Anyhow, because of our success with VPC for trace compression, we figured, well, you know, maybe we can compress floating point data with that as well, too. Um, fortunately, this turned out to be much harder than I expected. First of all, floating point values are really hard to compress, okay? Um, and the reason is, so I have 13 really cool data sets, I think, from all over the world. I have uh, weather satellite data from Europe. I have... Uh, 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 simulation of the comet shoemaker levy 9 entering Jupiter's atmosphere from Florida. I have, um, uh, let's see, I have data simulation uh, code from, from weather forecasting. I have uh, brain injury simulations. I have uh, code from messages from some parallel computational fluid dynamics code that they send between the nodes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. <coughs> so, when looking at this data, I found that over half of the traces, over 90% of the values appear exactly once. Okay? That's not a good starting point for data compression. <laughs> Moreover, we really want to compress these things very quickly because in the high performance computing environment, and that's the reason why they don't use compression right now, is they will not add another stage to their processing if it slows things down, okay? Um, these systems are so expensive, well, you know, they'll just buy a few more terabytes of disk space if they need it. Um, so what, the only chance you have is if you can provide real-time compression, that is, you can compress the data faster than it's being produced and hopefully actually get a speed up in the process because now you have to deal with less data. And that's what I'm trying to shoot for. <clears throat> now, actually, we're, we're sort of in luck because it turns out you don't have to precisely predict the values. As long as you get close, uh, that should suffice because then you can just encode the difference between your prediction and the actual data, which will hopefully be a small number. And you can encode that with few bits. So if you look at the uh, IEEE 754 double precision format, if you um, try to predict the value and you, you're close, then hopefully you'll have the right sign bit, you'll have the right exponent bits, and the top few mantissa bits will be correct too. Down here is the random part, okay? But if you get it right, then you really only need to record this part because the rest you get from the predictor, and that's how um, you can achieve compression. <coughs> and here is the actual algorithm up on top again I'm showing an uncompressed uh, trace. It's just a sequence of double precision values. So this uh, red number here is a hex representation of some double. <coughs> and what I do is um, I try to predict it with two predictors, an FCM and a DFCM. I don't have time to run more than two predictors. Okay? Then I pick the closer value of the two predictions, and I XOR it with the true value. And if the two values are similar, um, there will be lots of leading zeros after the XOR because XOR turns identical bits into zeros, and it's reversible. Then I use a leading zero byte counter, not bit, byte counter, because that's much faster than bit counting. And um, I encode it in the following format. I record one bit that tells me whether I use the left or the right predictor, and three bits to encode the number of leading zero bytes, and the remaining bytes are just emitted the way they are. Okay? And because of this 4-bit field here, I actually always compress pairs of doubles together because then I can merge the 4-bit fields into a single byte, and then everything is done at the byte granularity, which is much faster than bit granularity. <coughs> okay. Note further that this algorithm was actually totally co-designed was its implementation, OK? 
Okay? I tried a lot of different ideas, different predictors, different numbers of bits and leading bytes, bits and whatnot, counters. And I, I only took whatever I could find a very efficient implementation for. Moreover, once I've kind of settled on the algorithm, I tried as many different versions of each component, each predictor, the leading zero byte counter, et cetera, et cetera, that I could think of. I compiled all of them on four different architectures and on four different compilers. I timed them and I looked at the actual assembly code to see what was good, what was easy for a compiler to generate efficient code for. And uh, this algorithm is actually the result. <coughs> And to give you a little more um, information about this co-design, so I focused on the innermost loop, which compresses a, a block of uh, data. So it takes about uh, 50 C statements to decompress a pair of doubles and 70 C statements to compress a pair of doubles. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a reasonable loop size. <coughs> um, even after all of our optimizations, this is where 90% of the execution time is spent. So clearly this loop is the critical loop and, and everything else you can forget. <coughs> so the first thing I did is um, change the hash table accesses in the following way. So those are the only ones that cost cache misses. Okay? And what I do is I always use the hash table and I immediately request the next hash and then use the rest of the loop body to hide the latency before I actually use the, the value. Okay? Second, even though we're compressing floating point data, there's not a single floating point operation in the entire um, algorithm. I do everything in the much faster integer domain. And there are only two kinds of slow integer operations, namely multiplication and division. They don't occur. Okay? I only have shifts, adds, subtracts, and logic operations for the entire algorithm. Yes? Still a slow operation on modern chips? Oh, absolutely. I mean, compared to add and subtract, which takes one cycle, multiplication usually takes in the order of seven cycles. So, yes. <clears throat> Sorry? Brings up the question about specialized processes for. I mean, sure. Some that you're doing sure. A single cycle and also <coughs> vector processing. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing, which I think is, is is quite impressive, is so there are 50 to 70 C statements. They compile into zero branches. Okay, branches are obviously slow, um, so it's good to get rid of them. And the reason is that I wrote the code in such a way that there are lots of if statements in there. Okay, don't get me wrong. But their bodies are trivial in the sense that they either allocate, uh, assign a constant to a local scalar variable, or they copy one local scalar variable into another. And all compilers and all four architectures that I tried this on can convert that into conditional moves. Okay? So the result is a single basic block with over 100 machine instructions. Okay? This is perfect for scheduling and for exposing ILP. And in fact, on the widest machine where I tried this, which is a Nitanium 2, which can theoretically um, run six instructions per cycle with hash tables that are small enough to actually fit in the L1 data cache, I get sustained 5.4 instructions executed per cycle for decompression and 5.1 for compression, which is a pretty impressive ILP. <laughs> so. Let me show you the results. Okay. I'm, I'm going to plot the throughput, so higher is better, against the compression ratio down here. Again, higher is obviously better for several algorithms um, on those 13 data sets that I mentioned earlier. So here is BZIP2 um, going from its fastest mode to slightly slower but better compressing up to the best compressing but slowest mode. Um, Compresses these uh, traces by a factor of about one and a half on average. Um, it's so slow that it seems to be hugging the zero line here. Um, Gzip, as is well known, is slightly faster but doesn't compress as well, and that's exactly what's reflected here. Now, these two algorithms don't know about floating point data. They just chop them up into bytes and try to compress them. Okay? The other four algorithms um, actually are specific 
specifically designed for floating point data. So here is one by Peter Lindstrom from uh, Lawrence Livermore. Um, this one tries to take advantage of 2D and 3D information, which we don't have for our traces, which is why it doesn't compress better. But it is actually faster than GZIP, uh, which is a little hard to see. <laughs> now, FSD is the algorithm that uh, assumes that the data is smooth, which is not the case for our traces, which is why it doesn't compress very well at all. It is pretty fast, though. Okay. <laughs> And then here is DFCM, which is our first version, which uses just a single value predictor, and it does not operate on byte granularity, which uh, makes it slower. It's still faster than the other algorithms, and it compresses reasonably well. I mean, only BZIP is, is really faster. <clears throat> and here is um, FPC. So this is the algorithm I've been talking about so far. Obviously, much faster. Um, in fact, for any given average compression ratio, it's 10 to 100 times faster than the other algorithms. Moreover, if you make the tables really large, it does get slow because of all the cache misses, but it does reach much higher compression ratios um, than, than the other algorithms. <clears throat> Decompression picture looks almost exactly the same. All the numbers are actually slightly higher, so the, the throughput is, is a little bit better for decompression. Um, if you look up on the top here, um, this is where the predictor tables fit in the L1 data cache. We're close to 7 gigabits per second. Um, obviously, that's a nice throughput for um, compiled C code running on a general purpose um, machine. <coughs> Uh, so to summarize this uh, last part of the talk, I showed you that value predictors can quickly approximate scientific uh, data and, and therefore uh, this can be used to uh, compress the data as, as we've done in the FPC algorithm, um, which gives you the highest mean compression ratio, um, again on average, not on every single trace, but it does give you the highest compression and decompression throughput on every single trace that we've tried. <clears throat> in absolute terms, I've uh, seen compression ratios uh, from 1.02, which is useless, <laughs> to 15, which is pretty good. But as you saw in the previous slides, on average, it's under a factor of two. But, you know, for a floating point, this is actually pretty good. Because if you think about it, if you generate a terabyte of data per day, saving a few hundred gigabytes every day is not so bad. Okay? Now, in terms of absolute throughput on this 1.6 gigahertz titanium-2, we decompress at 840 megabytes per second, and we compress at 680 megabytes per second. That's obviously faster than hard disks, <coughs> uh, faster than gigabit connections. Uh, and if you do the math, this amounts to only nine machine cycles to uh, decompress a double, or 12 and a half on average, to compress a double. Now, the interesting thing here is that these aren't average numbers. These are the same for every program. Because, remember, the loop is just a single basic block, which means for compressing or decompressing a double, it always goes through exactly the same instructions. Therefore, and if, if the tables fit in the L1 cache, and the loads are the only instructions in that loop body that have variable latency, if they fit in the L1 cache, they always hit, so the latency is fixed. So therefore, the code runs at exactly the same speed, independent of the data and independent of the achieved compression ratio, which is very nice because this is a real-time guarantee. Okay? I can tell you up front how long it will take to compress your data. I, I, I don't care what data you give me. Okay, so. Uh, or, I mean, is it independent of also the uh, accuracy? Oh, this is lossless compression, so. No, I realize, but you're, you're, you're looking at a difference, right? You're, mat you're, you're uh, fitting it to something. And oh, yeah, I mean, like I said, I mean, it's independent of the compression ratio. However, um, obviously, the output size that you then have to do something else with, that is dependent on, on the compression. The sensors have some max signal to noise and, and being able to adapt that 
signal to noise and throw away that extra thing. That's what I'm wondering. Okay, well, I mean, this is not really the area I'm targeting, right? I'm targeting high-performance scientific environments where I'm assuming they currently can store away the data at maximum rate already. So, right? Yeah, I, I don't know, but but then if you need a guarantee that you're not going to produce more than a certain amount of megabytes per second, that's a very different uh, guarantee than the guarantee that you can process a certain number of of bytes per second. Yeah. Uh, if I take that the uh, almost horizontal part of the uh, top part of your decompression chart and, and extrapolate to zero, it, it looks as if it's it's cheaper to decompress compressed data than to read the raw data of memory. Is that so or you get some No, 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 no. That's impossible. <laughs> right? I'm I, I'm reading my data out of memory and, and I do something on it. So clearly if I just read it and didn't do anything on it. Um, you read the compressed data here. Yes. Yeah, but uh, I mean, on this slide, I'm yeah, reading the. No, but decompression. How how fast will it be just to read data from memory on the same scale? Oh, I don't know, but uh, I'm sure it's much faster, because. Uh, you hope so. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> I mean, like I said here, so it takes uh, so many cycles to essentially read. Or, or write a double, mm -hmm. and the Itanium 2 can actually read and write two doubles mm -hmm. per second, uh, per cycle. So, so clearly, uh, that's much, much, much higher. I thought that the experiments you ran and uh, you discussed in the first part of the talk, there it's much cheaper to read compressed data and decompress it online. From a read. hard disk? Yeah, he, he's asking from memory. Okay, so again, if you're interested in FPC, the source code is available online at this URL or from my homepage. And I, I currently only, this is very new work, I, I, I'm only aware of one user, um, but the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasts actually uses an earlier version of FPC um, for compressing some of their satellite data, which is kind of neat. <laughs> so, so. <clears throat> Is it, what is it? Uh, okay, uh, it seems like the, there's a lot, right? There's a lot of uh, space data that would actually be very amenable to this. Right. right? I guess the question would be, um, you need a fair amount of uh, horsepower to actually do this compression. So it may not work in spacecraft, for example, to have the thing do the compression just because it needs a fast processor, basically. Right? Well, if you decide to build hardware that specifically does this, okay. right. doing this and nothing else, and it doesn't have to be general purpose. I think you could easily do that. So all of this is done on a on an x86 base. No, x this is Itanium two. Yeah, but x64, x64, or x or 32-bit 64. 64-bit x86 architectures. Itanium two is not x86. Itanium two is is it's epic. It's totally different. It's a VLIW. Oh, well, okay. But I have results for for Pentium yeah, four AMD. Um, yeah, I mean, the trends are similar. The other machines are slower in absolute terms, but, I mean, that affects all the algorithms. Um, the, the difference between, the difference here is not as high because here we're running at over five instructions per cycle. All the other machines don't even support that. I mean, they have four or three-way superscalar, and that's why I can't exploit all the parallelism that I have there, which is why the gap is smaller, but it's at least a factor of two on all the machines that I've seen up to a factor of 10, like I said, on this machine. <clears throat> I just wonder, I mean, architectures are going towards including um, the vector processors inside of it that my guess is will fundamentally change these processor speeds. I mean, the, your algorithm speed, right, if you're doing Certainly, multiply accumulates in, in seven seven cycles, which are walked down to ones. I mean that that could be on average, yeah, that, that that could be possible. Yeah. So that's what I'm, are you looking towards doing things? That are you looking at different architectures to apply this to at this point? Um, not right now. My goal was to write a portable piece of C source code that will almost certainly run well on on just about any architecture that that you use it on because. That's what people are likely to 
to use right away. If you do anything else, then yeah, maybe it'll be useful in 10 years. <clears throat> Uh, you mentioned using conditional moves. Right. Uh, do any of them depend on the carry bit? Because currently it seems impossible to use a carry bit efficiently on Intel processors. No, no. As far as I, no, they all check um, either a whole 32 or 64 bit variable for zero, or um, they check like the least significant bit or something like that. There's no addition in, in the in the condition. That that would not no compile. Also sets a carry bit and and it seems there's no good way to use it. No, 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 no. It depends on the type of comparison. If you compare for equality, you don't have a carry bit. Um, so to conclude the entire talk, so I hope I showed you that uh, architecture and code optimization ideas can be applied uh, successfully to areas that they weren't designed for originally. And, and I've showed you this on VPC, which uses uh, a softer version of value predictors to, to compress traces. TCGen, which obviously uses compilation and code optimization techniques to uh, automatically generate uh, trace compressors. FPC, which again uses value predictors as their predict or compression model and uh, heavily depends on code optimization, mostly on knowing what can uh, efficiently be compiled and executed on, on current existing systems. And I guess uh, uh, what I think is, is particularly interesting about this work is that I took ideas from one domain that wasn't very successful and turned them into quite successful ideas in, in a different domain for which they were never uh, designed originally. <coughs> And with this, I'd like to thank you all for being here and uh, NSF and DOE and Intel Corporation for supporting this work. <clears throat> Any more questions? Yeah, Ben? So I guess, uh, you know, I'm curious, have you thought at all about the sort of specialized hardware to, to support your, your fully quick compression decompression? Because um, yes, I have. Can't say any more about it. Well, let me let me tell you this. We currently have a paper under submission to uh, the data compression conference uh, that that uh, does uh, hardware compression of, of traces, program traces. And have you looked at all at GPU stuff? I mean, that, that's certainly becoming a more yeah. I'm uh, I'm access. going to California next week to talk to a company that specializes in exactly that. And I will figure out what they have to say, and and see see where that. And leads. you can tell us that company's name, right? Yeah, it's called Peakstream. Okay. Because interestingly enough, Intel also is now trying to produce a board level, super twenty four core ish kind of GP GPU, which would. Right. Probably screen, of course, but they're also pulling that into their processors, as well as allowing that on their chipsets. And there's not going to be a machine that, that doesn't have an accessible GPGPU on, whether that's in Intel or AMD with ATI or something like that. I mean, all of them will have some form of accessible GPGPU, which would I would expect that to really lower some of that. Yes, hopefully. Well, you know, I mean, they have super wide back. No, no, I understand. The question is, uh, I mean, you have to change your algorithm if you really want to want to exploit it, which I believe I can, but I've said that many times in the past, and it turned out not to be true. So <laughs> I, I want to be careful. <laughs> okay, so another question about, yeah, so you obviously extended this effectively to the flow point domain. Have you thought about other domains and, you know, sort of how to... How do I care for? It seems like a lot of people care about compression for a lot of different kinds. Of yes. Uh, let me ask you this: What other domains are there? <laughs> Plugging point and uh, and so in it's teacher X, XML. It's one. I think I'm XML. Excited. Okay, so text compression, basically. Well, yeah, or yeah, whatever. It'd be interesting to know what what kind of XML needs to be compressed. I mean, that's an interesting question too. But um, and the other one came to mind is bioinformatic data. Okay. Um, you know, uh, gene DNA sequencing. Bioinformatic. Okay, um, on, on, on the former, on, on text, I, I have tried it briefly more as a fun experiment. So because all of my approaches are lossless, so they're guaranteed 
to recreate the original data. You don't have to give it a valid trace. You can, I, I ran, I think, my dissertation through it, okay? Um, uh, it works fine. I mean, it recreates it, right? You don't get better compression ratios than out of other tools, and it is not faster than other tools, so there's really no point in, in using this particular algorithm. Um, I'm talking about TCGen now. FPC would, would work really not well on text, okay? Um, as far as bioinformatics data, I've actually uh, downloaded some rat chromosomes <laughs> exactly for this purpose, and I tried to compress them, and that did not work well at all. Now, they, they are not highly compressible with any of the algorithms I showed you today, so you really need, I guess, a, a different set of algorithms that's uh, specialized for, for that type of domain. Are you talking about sequence? I mean, is that because it's a binary data set that's... Well, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's two bits, sure. right, because yeah, they're four, right. yeah. Right, right. So, I mean, it has structure a lot like this floating point data, that, but it's just really a matter of sort of figuring no, out... No, it doesn't. See, that's the same. Well, yeah. it has some structure. I mean, it's not maybe the same kind Yeah, of you know it's one of four, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, but there are multiple levels of structure, right? There's yes, two, that's right, that's right. Kind of but that's what I'm saying. You need special algorithms that are aware of this or at least can figure this right. out, which BZIP doesn't. Right, right. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, another domain which may be lucrative is email, where every message quotes every previous message all the way to Adam and Eve. Uh, <laughs> and he can compress some of it, but if you know that this is what messages do, and I suspect lots of email so does, does not know it. Yes, I oh, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm sure of that. Emails, but for mine, I want loss. Yeah, want yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I want it from the beginning. Actually, you know, I want lossy from the beginning. Most of it I don't want to know. Are you familiar Most, with, I'm kidding. Are you familiar with yeah, thread compressor? I can't hear you. Are you familiar with thread compressor? Thread, no. It, which is a great tool. Internal Microsoft tool, which essentially does the same thing. I see. Thread compressor. I'll, I'll it's on toolbox. Yeah. Um, I have a question about the port, you know, executable code domain. Yes. So I work on, um, uh, so we compress Windows updates, software okay. updates. So we do a lot of binary patching work, and you know, that's differential compression. Right. Uh, that's not really the question I have right now. But no matter how much binary patching we do, we always have to have a standalone version of the update. Okay. So, you know, something that's not a patch, which is, you know, actually the binaries themselves. Typically, yep. people use them when they want to use, uh, distribute them using other mechanisms for other than Windows Update. Uh, so my question would be uh, some some algorithm tuned specifically to PE code. Now we have something, a few transforms that we do that improve, uh, so some pre-compression transforms. I mean, we're aware okay. of Boros Wheeler. We don't actually do that yet, but um, things like uh, smashing uh, blocks, uh, the lock instructions. Uh, getting rid of them, transforming those away, doing some stuff with E8 jumps. Uh, are you familiar with anything else which works well for? Uh, I haven't really done any work in this domain. I think there was uh, was or is somebody at uh, Arizona who who um, published a, a few things like in, in several years ago already. This isn't particularly new work, yeah. but if I remember right, what they basically do is they kind of decode the instructions a little bit. They know where the opcode is. They know where the register specifiers are, et cetera, et cetera. And then either they um, compress them separately or they uh, rename it effectively so that they get more patterns that repeat, et cetera. And I think Chris Frazier used to work here. He did some work in, in that domain as well. So you're probably more familiar than I am with, with that. Um, so yeah, I, I like I said, I haven't personally done yeah, anything. Yeah, you know, anybody in the room is looking for a lucrative opportunity, I mean, that's it. Um, <laughs> especially because you know things like big service packs. Yeah. Um, they literally affect the bottom line. Somebody's paying for all that bandwidth. Um, mm -hmm. right. Are you familiar of uh, code compression work using eco instructions? Eco instructions. Brad Calder, he he works at Microsoft now. Uh, he has done, uh, done some work on uh, code compression using echo instructions. Thank you. Yeah, well, that might be that might be Chris Frazier's work uh, sort of originally. So Chris Chris is the guy who actually came up with the echo instruction. Oh, did he? Yeah. So, so. ECO echo echo instruction. Yeah. So that's a uh, ECHO. So yeah. Okay. But that's assuming you have hardware support. Okay. I mean, the whole notion of echo instructions is that it's a the hardware mechanism. So. Thank you. All right. Well,
Thank you.